All right, so uh, so it's just gone half past four, so we should probably um, get started. Um, so thanks for coming along uh, to this meeting on October 19th. Uh, so this uh, this is just a general meeting. We um, uh, Paul Willis and I have been having monthly Skype calls just to talk about the project, and it occurred to us that we um, we could really be doing with having these things on a more open way. Uh, so this is uh, the first one of those, um, which allows anyone to join in and see where we're going uh, and to chip in. So if anyone does want to um, to chip in, then feel free to use the chat window. Or if you want to speak and talk about something, I can enable you as a presenter. Uh, and, and that's no problem at all. Uh, but just raise your hand or otherwise indicate that you want to say something. Uh, or I might bring people in at, at key moments if, if, if we need people to talk about some stuff. Um, there's an agenda on the bottom right there in the discussion notes window, which uh, says uh, says wh what I think we, we might want to talk about. Um, so if anyone has got any general things that they want to say at the start, then we can deal with those. Otherwise, I guess we could start by uh, dealing with the agenda as written there. So uh, anyone want to say anything by way of starting up, or should we just get straight in? Everyone's all right? Okay. All right. That's good. Um, so uh, the agenda is the first thing that, uh, that I thought we could talk about is just some new results that have come in um, on a few of the compounds. So these are the comp some of the comments that we've been making here um, on ARL, the ARL Pyrrhal series and also on uh, Jimmy's two series. So these are the triazole urea and cyanopyrimidine series. There's a link there which takes you to the electronic lab notebook, which takes you to the picture file of all the data. Um, and these are just come in. Now these are preliminary, so we just got them. Vicky uh, was at pains to, to say that. So uh, she, uh, I think, would like to confirm these results and send the actual numbers. Um, but as a summary, the, uh, the update is basically that we've got so a problem with the phone, that we've got uh, essentially uh, these compounds as shown are inactive, um, apart from the two that are shown in the box. Um, in the blue box, so uh, OSM S56 and OSM S67. So the two of the the original triazole urea hit is uh, OSM S56, um, and a precursor to that compound, um, actually two steps prior, a simpler compound OSM S67, is also fairly well. It's a, you know approximately the same activity. Um, so those two are active. So that confirms the original hit from the GSK screen. And one of the precursors is also active. Um, one of the uh, very preliminary molecules on the on the thionipyrimidine series, OSM S70, is uh, weakly active, micromolar active, uh, but has substantial hemolysis associated with it. So those are the act; those are the to some extent actives. The other compounds, particularly all the ones for the aryl pyrrole series, are are at the moment inactive. We don't have numbers for them yet, so we haven't got the final data from Vicky. But she sent it through because she knew we were having a meeting, which was very kind of her. So she sent those through and they're inactive. So that's pretty amazing if that's the case. So the original compound is shown at the top there. Um, and the and of course, we've made some derivatives of that already. But these are the most recent seven that have been put through, some with extremely minor changes. Um, so the compound on the right there, uh, OSM S68, was Mac and Dean's compound. And that the only difference between that and the original is that we've got that gem dimethyl there. Uh, and we, of course, put that in because we were trying to suppress what we thought might be a problem with the compound, which is the hydrolysis of the ester. Uh, and that at the moment appears to be an inactive compound, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and some of the others are minor changes. So there's a pyrazole uh, OSM S57 uh, is essentially the same compound except pyrazole instead of the pyrrole, the dimethylpyrrole. And that is, again, apparently inactive. So these are, yeah, I mean, this is pretty surprising, I guess, in the sense that the original compound seems to be very sensitive to small changes. Um, now, I guess I just want to uh, preface this by saying that we are, of course, make, still making significant derivatives of this series. And we'll get to that when we talk about the next agenda item, about who's making what. But these are some of the compounds that we made as essentially trivial derivatives of these. Um, uh, and I guess we're pretty surprised that there, there's uh, little activity on some of these compounds. So, um, based on the data shown, does anyone want to 
say what they think uh, this means or, uh, or suggestions about what we ought to be doing with these compounds. Go for it, Paul. Go for it, Paul. Uh, hi, Matt. I, I just wanted to check. I, I, I'm sure everything did work fine because Vicky sent the results through, but did she include data showing that the controls uh, were all of the required potency? Uh, I, I'm sure she would have done or she wouldn't have released any sets of results, but that would be the first thing to check, obviously. Definitely. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, so uh, we, just yeah, so we just had a meeting. Murray uh, made exactly the same point um, that uh, we did, sorry, included in the data sh uh, get, uh, sent to us were, that were, were not the standards, so either a known compound or the original compound, uh, PMY102, the GSK compound. So we don't know for sure that they were there, but yeah, my assumption was the same as yours, that Vicky would have, uh, would have included that. But no, so we have to check that. So I guess if, if we take it at the moment that these results are true, obviously, I think we shouldn't do anything precipitous at this stage. We should wait uh, and confirm with, with the full IC50s. But 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 that would suggest, obviously, a very tight SAR. Uh, surprising, but not exceptional. So it's it, it, there would be good precedents where where such small changes could uh, obliterate activity. But but it might help the decision in terms of uh, if this. If these results propagate through, then there probably isn't much mileage in terms of changing the structure. So that that might help us with the decision about whether whether the series should continue or not. An interesting point that uh, Alice made um, when she was just looking at these structures just now is the uh, the comparison between the the, the hit compounds of PMY102 and um, and the triazole urea compound, so OSMS56, one of the active compounds. Um, in the sense that there's, you know, an association between a ring and, and a, 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 a terminal amide with an intervening polar group. Um, she was, I guess, wondering whether or not these compounds might have a similar mechanism of action, to, um, which might suggest that we should make the compound. Um, so let's see. So uh, if, if you look in the red box on the top left, OSMS59, um, if you imagine that compound lacking the right-hand component, so lacking the terminal amide, and just terminating instead in a, in a dimethyl amino, uh, di dimethyl amide group. So you, you, you cut off the NH2, the carbonyl, and you're left with two methyls on you. The comparison between that and the triazole urea in terms of just gross similarity, um, she was wondering whether there may be a, a, a similar mechanism of action. I guess if that was, if that was a possibility, that could be addressed by a, a rate of killing assay, if that was of interest. I mean, it's a really nice uh, suggestion. I can't remember. Did, did we make some compounds like that in the first round, where we where we just had amides there? I'm not sure we had dimethyl, but uh, that would be worth just going back and checking. So yeah, so, I think yeah, we, I think did. we did. Um, on that, we yeah only yeah we only made the primary amide, I think. Uh, but so Paul is just saying. I don't think we we didn't truncate it at that, did we? So we didn't have uh, that truncated side chain. Do you want to, uh, Paul? Do you want me to? Do you want to talk about this a little bit? Uh, one second. You're um, you're on, uh, Paul. If you want to just talk to the, the idea of uh, what we made at the start, are you able to say something? Have to enable your mic if you want to do that. Got a mic, just um, yeah. But as Alice says, we've got plenty of the relevant acid, so we could uh, easily convert it to dimethyl amide. Yeah, it's an interesting. Go, go for it. So, so I think if if you've, if you've got the intermediate and we've and we've not done it, then it's just a step to make that that would be definitely uh, worth doing. Uh, so, uh, so we can, we could put them into a PRR assay to, to give indications of whether they're the same mechanism. Obviously, because you know we kind of categorise things as slow, medium, or fast. So, as there's only three categories almost, it's it's not conclusive evidence that things act by the same mechanism. I think another thing, uh, as you're aware, another group is interested in the trisolo urea series. Uh, 
a, a concern we'd had from from the start of this series is just how reactive they are because you could conceive of that uh, 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 kind of just releasing the triazole that it could be kind of like an isolating agent so uh, I don't know if it would be interesting to, to get comments on, from, from the chemists on whether they saw any sort of enhanced ability of that group that may indicate that that the mechanism of action might be sort of more of a of covalent binding, which isn't what we want, rather than uh, just just uh, interacting with with a particular ion channel receptor or whatever. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the plan of um, uh, sorry, hang on a second, Dallas. I just saw your comment. So the. Um, uh, you're enabled, Alice. If you want to, if you want to enable your mic. The uh, so yeah, I think the the immediate plan of attack then is to is to uh, make sure these numbers are confirmed with Vicky, make sure the controls are included, um, and then presumably compare these things to uh, to the the data we're going to get from the the finishing off of this series. I, mean, I guess that's the obvious. Thing. Okay, um, Alice, did you want to say anything about this uh, series before we move on to the talking about the rest of the ARL Pirol series? Alex, that was actually a question to you. Uh, so, did you want to talk about this bit? We were just swapping um, headphones over. <laughs> oh, I see. Sorry. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right, that's fine. If everyone's happy with that, then we can move on to the next uh, agenda item, um, which, which is to um, just to talk about the. Oh, the current Frederick's state. got a point on there. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Frederick, there is. Uh, I, sh I should mention. So Frederick is uh, is uh, from a contract research organisation who have an interest in uh, making some of these compounds, and I, I invited along. Uh, has been sending us uh, synthetic schemes and some prices of molecules that are needed for the project, uh, and because he was interested in the open uh, the open way of doing the project, and had mentioned that he was happy to um, provide uh, synthetic routes um, in in the spirit of the open project. Uh, then I, I thought he could come along and and, uh, and see uh, what's going on with the project. So uh, he's just commented that he agrees um, with you. Uh, yeah. Okay. And there's a yeah. There's a okay. Sanjay is talking about a, a urea replacement instead of the amide. I mean, these are all good suggestions. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, we have to. So for the triazolurea series, uh, just to make it clear that yes. Uh, 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 we are aware that another group is working on these, and I don't, I don't want to go too much more into that series um, without making sure that we're not duplicating any, any, um, any resources of, that, that are being expended elsewhere. Uh, so we, if we're going to do any work on that, we have to make sure that we're, we're in the clear there. Um, but certainly, these kind of small changes to the to the ARL pearls is a good idea. All right. Okay. So the agenda item two is on uh, completing the series. So I posted uh, a couple of days ago um, a summary of, of, uh, of who's doing what um, on the 10 synthetic compounds. Uh, before I get to that, I should just say that the, uh, the 10 commercial compounds, actually 11 commercial compounds uh, in this series um, are currently on their way. They're, they're due to arrive in Sydney on uh, Monday, stroke Tuesday. Um, they should clear customs pretty quickly because multiple have taken care of that. Uh, and then we are going to uh, take out some and send immediately to Vicky, um, who said that she will try and get that. So hopefully they'll be with Vicky in a week's time, so next Friday, uh, if, assuming the courier works fine. And then uh, those will be assessed hopefully in a week, uh, Vicky says, so before the end of the month. Uh, so that will include the 11 compounds in the ARL Pyrrhal series, as well as uh, several other compounds that we purchased on the thionipyrimidine series. Uh, so we should get data for those before the end of the month. Which will be good. So that will take care of the synthetic side. Uh, sorry, sorry, the commercial side of the ARL Pyrrhal series, which leaves the synthetic side. Um, and the so the compounds S A to S J there. Uh, there's there's that summary. Um, uh, S A we've just been talking about. Um, that was the Madden Madden Dean compound, which is uh, the gem dimethyl compound, which is inactive. Um, as far as I. Oh, yeah, that's right. And um, so we, so I guess we've assessed that already, um, and that leaves the others. So uh, for S, B, and S, J, 
these were compounds that uh, Paul has uh, essentially got. Um, do you want to give us a very short update on that, Paul, if you're able? Uh, you are you still on on? All right. Paul? Hello. Yeah. Hi. So this was um, sorry. The swapping the headphones is slightly annoying at the moment. Um, okay, so we are. You were asking about the compounds that I've just made. Yeah. Um, SB, so that would be the. Yeah, so SB, um, I made uh, actually a couple of months ago up to the ester stage and hydrolyzed that down. Um, and um, I actually, funnily enough, um, just with uh, ethanol chloride um, to convert to the acid chloride, it was just, well, it didn't actually do anything on the first go, but I didn't hit it very hard. I just, uh, you know, tried that briefly. Um, but I've just done that with um, an unfortunate uh, EDC coupling to introduce the amide in there. Uh, but it worked, so just, you know, EDC and um, uh, and ammonium hydroxide. And um, But that's actually on quite small scale, so we're, we, we essentially have that compound. Um, but I'll need to bring through actually another couple of MIGs, um, <laughs> so it's actually clean. Um, the other one, the um, desmethyl pyrazole um, compound. Yep, SJ. Um, that's that's perfectly fine and complete. Um, so um, yeah, so we'll be I'm, sending SJ definitely up with indeed. the compounds of the Kinex week. Yeah, and it's almost certain that we'll be sending the 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 oxazole, um, pyrrole, right. oxazole, amide, also. Right. So SB um, is the is the amide of the ester, which uh, just came through as inactive. So it's going to be interesting to see if that's active. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, given that the uh, well, we'll see. I'm I'm not entirely hopeful, but uh, as that's the only one that would be good to check, um, and then we'll have a pretty good picture if that is actually going to be at work as a uh, as an amide isosteer for us anyway. Um, but Alice is targeting some of the other. The other uh, uh, ISIS layers there, so that would be the S. I don't actually have that correct diagram up here. That's SF. Yeah, SF. So um, I don't know, maybe that's good to talk about as well. Maybe sure, okay. Are you able to swap out uh, headphones? Uh, yep. and, and Absolutely. <laughs> uh, five seconds. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the compound that, um, uh, that Paul's talking about there is the oxidiazole, so SF. And uh, Alice uh, was looking at the synthesis of that, one of the isomers. Uh, uh, she'll be able to talk about it. She designed a synthesis of that and has uh, made a, a lot of progress on that. Alice, are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so that one also featured a bit of an ugly um, EDC coupling to try and make the hydrazine because the, uh, the procedure that we really expected to work with, with just the ester and the hydrazine, just, it didn't uh, mm. result in any conversion of the ester. Um, it's not a very clean reaction or very high yielding and I've been having a, a bit of problem with the acylation of that which I've just tried with acetyl chloride uh, for the moment whilst we're waiting for the right um, chemicals to come in um, but hopefully I've managed to get that compound today and then it should just be um, a, a cyclization with POC or, uh, sorry, um, yes, a dehydration um, to get the final compound. Um, and once I've worked out this chemistry, I'm hoping it's going to work um, with all the other compounds that we could make. So um, we're hoping to make a few derivatives of that oxidiazole. And hopefully if John Wallace gets on board, then we should have um, both sets of the oxidiazoles in hand for the for testing. Yeah, that's very good. So the, um, yeah, the, the background to that is uh, at the conference, um, we were at Paul, uh, the, the, a guy that I, I, I knew from, uh, for, uh, for a reason that's too long to talk about now, uh, from Nottingham Trent, John Wallace, uh, was talking to me about the project and said that he had someone in the lab who would be interested in doing some synthesis. And so we got in touch and he was interested in making uh, SF. Um, and that was around the same time that I, I realized from talking to others that there, there are, there's an interest in making isomers of SF. So I, I think hopefully, uh, John is is uh, will be able to convince his, his student to make um, uh, I think SF as drawn. In fact, I think Alice is making the isomer. I'm getting my, my facts the right way around. So uh, we we're, we're waiting to hear back from him, uh, but hopefully he'll be able to do that. And it's indicated that he's happy to you know use the electronic lab notebook uh, and and so on. So hopefully that will be a compound from him. Um,
so that is um, takes into account. Uh, we talked about SA and SB. Um, I guess uh, the um, we were thinking about the uh, so the SC these amino acid derivatives. I think we need to wait until we have evaluated. Well, we've got the final data from Vicky about whether we want to evaluate those compounds. Um, if it turns out that the SC derivative where uh, we have an amino acid, but uh, it's glycine, so R is H. Uh, if that turns out to be, uh, if that turns out to be genuinely inactive, then I'm not sure there's much point in putting a lot of effort into making uh, amino acid derivatives where we think have things like alanine and phenylalanine and things like that. Um, unless anyone disagrees, it seems like uh, uh, we shouldn't spend too much longer on, on that set um, if that's the case. Um, this uh, takes us neatly on to um, SD. Uh, which is the ether-linked compound, um, which is proving to be a, a pain. Um, and we, we, despite our, our current best efforts, we haven't managed to get this, this compound. Um, and I'm, uh, it's, it's, it's a little strange that it's being so difficult, um, but yeah, it's taking a bit of time and, and we haven't really uh, made a lot of um, we haven't made significant inroads into that compound. I don't know what people's thoughts are on that. Um, this was potentially a compound that we could try to uh, get quotes for from the CRO community if people wanted to have a crack at that. We've, we've done quite a lot of work on that compound now. And so we have a lot of potentially useful negative data um, for people to learn from um, in order to give a realistic assessment of whether that can be made. Or not. So I think that if we were going to be specific now with the CRO community, that would be where I'd like to the, the effort to be applied. Uh, yeah, Frederick, you did send me something for that. Didn't you? One moment. If anyone has got some comments on that ether compound about its desirability, please say. I'm just uh, trying to find something on an email. Oh, so it's Paul, so. I'm really starting to wonder now then whether we should put huge effort into into the ether compound. Uh, it's looking like it's going to be a tough synthetic challenge, and given how tight the SAR is, the chance of it being active, uh, we might get lucky, but it's looking relatively slight. So it could be time just to start being pragmatic, uh, because if it's going to take you know, someone a serious amount of time to make a compound that's relatively speculative, then their effort is, is probably better directed elsewhere, even if it is then just to, to some of the series, I'd say. But, but, but be interested in other people's views on that. Yeah, yeah I agree. It, it depends on the, um, uh, it does depend on, on the amount of effort. I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, and sorry, Frederick, I can't find this thing right now that you sent me. The, uh, the uh, synthetic scheme. Um, apologies for that. I know you, you sent something through. Um, maybe this is something that we could um, we we'll may have to do offline unless anyone has that scheme to hand. I don't have it with me, but Frederick did send something through about the simple start content. Um, so yeah, I, th I think um, <clears throat> we can we could maybe discuss with, uh, with with Frederick and others about you know what 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 an approximate time frame might be based on. On, uh, on how it's looking. It is a surprising compound, and I think, yes, if this extends too much longer, we should ditch it. Um, I, would, I would agree with that. It's uh, difficult to make. Uh, I guess it does depend to some extent on the, um, on the quotes, uh, both in terms of expense and time. Um, again, for, uh, for the synthesis of these things by CROs, we were hoping for inputs to the project uh, free of charge, but of course, uh, that is not um, uh, what we'll see. If people want to demonstrate that they can uh, make this ether compound uh, for, for free when it's a difficult target, that would be uh, very useful. But we should uh, we'll, we'll see how, how that conversation goes. Um, certainly, from the stuff that Vicky just sent through on the ARL pyrroles, um, I mean, again, you know, we still haven't evaluated the ether compound. We we do have these preliminary data which suggest the secondary amine is inactive. So uh, back to agenda item one, that was uh, OSM. S58, the secondary amine is is, uh, is inactive. Um, changing that to an ether might solve a lot of things, uh, but yeah, I agree. It depends on the amount of effort it's going to take. 
<clears throat> so maybe uh, what we should do is compare, uh, off, we could do this offline, we could compare um, what we've done so far. So Alice has done a very nice post summarizing all of the work on this ether compound. Um, and we can compare that with uh, a, a scheme that Frederick sent through. Uh, and then maybe maybe post up this as as a way of deciding whether or not we we put a lot more effort into this uh, into this compound. All right, so I'm just going to um, uh, go back to the uh, the post we were looking at that talks about where we are with the, with the rest of the series. So that's the ethylene compound, the uh, ester to the sulfonamide, so the SE compound. Um, it's looking like uh, Matten has. Uh, has managed to sulfonate the uh, the pyrrole um, and is working right now on on the, the subsequent step, which would be make the sulfonyl chloride, which then we can couple with the with the amine. So we we think we're pretty close on that, and man is working on that uh, full time. So hopefully we'll have an answer on that about whether that's likely to work in, in about a week or so. Um, he's developed a nice he discovered a nice reaction, which got that sulfonation apparently to work by NMR. But we just got to make sure that we can uh, make the sulfonyl chloride and couple it with an amine. So that's looking quite promising, hopefully, if the chemistry goes well. So Mattin knows that uh, he's yeah, got to get this reaction sorted out pretty soon. Uh, the diazoles we talked about, um, pyrazole and oxazole compound SG, uh, we've uh, we discussed, right? Uh, Paul, uh, sorry, post-op Paul. Um, are you able to, uh, hang on a second, uh, I'm just scrolling down to the, the SD. So this is Matt, all right, this was Matt's compound. Sorry, we haven't talked about this yet. SD with the, oxid, uh, the oxazole and the, and, the, and the pyrazole was Matt, uh, our undergrad, Matt's compound. And, and again, he, he's made some good progress on that. Uh, he's got to finish his uh, undergrad project in a couple of weeks. Um, so in just in case he doesn't make it, uh, Murray, who's joined the project um, from another project, is going to bring through some material to nail that compound. Uh, so uh, Murray has started on that compound yesterday and is, is bringing material through. So again, I think that we'll have that pretty pretty soon. The chemistry was going very well, but uh, the undergrad didn't. Uh, Matt Tarnowski didn't, doesn't doesn't have an infinite time to, to put on this. So Murray's going to have a backup on that compound. Uh, just working through the remainder of these compounds. So SH, the variable heterocycle. Alice has been. Uh, making a, a few of those. She's made some of the compounds, but it's just in the process of purifying them. Uh, it sounds from the meeting we had last um, week, or earlier this week, that uh, these compounds just need to be uh, purified a little um, and are being a little bit annoying in terms of purification. But um, Alice has, a, has a, a couple of compounds, I think, that are ready to go from there, which is great. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Alice, or is that an accurate representation of where we, where we are? Um. Yeah, I think so. So me and Paul were just trying to, we were just trying to figure from the chat. Um, basically, these compounds um, they look like spot to spot reaction to make the uh, the amine derivatives, but the purification uh, leads to massive loss in yield, um, and they're still not entirely pure. So we've started to wonder whether these compounds are entirely stable or not. Um, it seems like there's something strange going on here, and that might be. Uh, an association with this, um, with the ether. We 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 don't know quite what's going on, but we we wonder whether whether there is a problem with stability here. Um. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, but the the the, the yeah but the, the crude reactions look fine, right? I mean, in the sense that you're you're getting these reductive am yep. uh, emanations to work. Yep. They're working, but it's just. The purity of the products yeah. isn't, it's not great after uh, columning. So I'm going to try some different methods of purification, but I'm just wondering whether it's an inherent stability okay. problem or not at the moment. I guess I'll see when I've made a couple more yeah. of these compounds. All right, excellent. Um, for Just for the fused ring, so the last compound I want to talk about, the, the SI, the fused ring compound. Um, uh, we So that, that heterocycle, that was that was shown there in, in compound SI was something that we just came up with, right? But we, we were interested in exploring other other heterocyclic rings. Um, and as I say in the update, um, Alice and Murray both have ideas about what we could make that red heterocycle in SI to be synthetically more accessible. 
uh, possibly one possibility is to make it a, a triazole itself so that we can make this thing from a quick process and Nori was looking into other alternative heterocycles for that system. Again, completely based on synthetic accessibility because we can't uh, spend a lot of time uh, trying out new chemistry. So I think maybe we'll we'll try maybe one or two, but it depends on um, on how well our chemistry goes. So that leaves. Um, so I don't know. Are you you're not able to talk um, at this point, Sanjay? You don't want. To, I think you've got a microphone problem or something. Is that right? So you have to you have to type, right? Yeah, we can't hear you, I'm afraid. Unfortunately, okay. So the um, at the moment, uh, am, am I right in saying is this an accurate representation? I'm right in saying that one of your uh, students is making one of the pyrazole, and is still uh, is still doing some chemistry on that. And uh, that is, that's right, isn't it? So there, there, but there, I think there is a, a student in Sanjay's lab is making um, is making one of these uh, pyrazole compounds. So I think, uh, I mean, again, you know, this, this synthesis will of, of this series will go on for uh, for another couple of weeks, maybe, until we're done. Um, at that point, we should probably make a call and send what we have. So I guess uh, within that time frame, anything that can be made and evaluated would be would be relevant to to this series. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, as 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 Paul Willis has said previously, we have a, a, a something of a time limit on, on this series, so we can make it, make a decision. So, if uh, Sanjay, if one of your students is able to make um, a compound or a precursor of a compound that we could evaluate um, in the next, I don't know, two three weeks, that would be of of, of, of most use to the to the project. Um, I don't know if that time frame is is uh, you know doable for your students with what they have to do at the moment. Okay, and the the starting by the starting material, you are meaning stuff that you've ordered, uh, not stuff you're waiting for from us or anything. Okay, so it's reagents. Yeah, sure. We we often have similar problems in Australia. Uh, okay, all right. So, um, I mean, if, if there's yeah, if there's something that we can do to help you out there, either by sending a precursor, then uh, let us know. That's perfectly doable. Um, so we should, if you have a continuous problem with that, then then we should talk about something something specific. Um, okay, so that, that that covers all the compounds that we are uh, are attempting to make. I think um, we I think we should. We, we can continue to have a conversation uh, with Frederick and anyone else in the private sector who might be interested in making the ether compound and see if that's doable in that kind of time frame. Uh, if it is doable in that kind of time frame and if the price is either zero dollars or is acceptable, then that becomes a possibility. Um, and it might be a, a neat way of, of getting around uh, a one problematic compound out of 10 or so would be um, to Spend a little bit of money to try and get this thing sorted. So that could be an interesting way of, of mixing uh, our, our uh, effort uh, on this project with with something from the private sector where it's needed. Um, so maybe uh, we'll spend another week or so just seeing how that ether compound could be made and the kind of time frame and cost, and then we'll make, we'll make a decision about whether to include that compound or not. Um, Okay, so that includes all those compounds. Uh, we will be sending the commercial compounds next week. Uh, we'll send whatever ones we have made with that, um, and then there may be calls uh, after next week if we're still waiting for some of these compounds, which I guess we would be, to send those as a as a as a final round, um, and then we can make a decision on the compounds. Vicky is is being extremely responsive and very helpful with 
with all of the testing, uh, which is great. I guess you just need a bit of warning that compounds are coming. Okay, so um, is there anything uh, else people would like to say on the uh, ARAL pyrrole series and the completion of the synthesis of that? I guess, Matt, it might just be worth starting to think uh, of a timeline when we'll have sort of the data from Vicky uh, confirmed actives for that set, because we might then want to be thinking sort of when we evaluated that set, how long the synthesis of the ongoing compounds is, is going to run for, and then from there sort of decide uh, when we're going to have sort of a meeting and decide sort of a stop go for the series. and. Uh, I hope that perhaps the next month's project meeting at the latest uh, would be able to do that. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's um, because um, so for the commercials and for any ones that we include next week, the data will be back before the end of the month. Um, I would hope that if we, yeah, I mean, let's say let's say in a month's time, we will try and uh, have data on on whatever we've got. Uh, yeah, by the next meeting, that seems like a good plan. Seems reasonable. If, if we need to postpone the meeting by a week to, to accommodate that, then maybe we can do that. But that kind of time frame seems reasonable um, based on, on the progress that we've made in these compounds already. I think that's perfectly doable, yeah. Okay, um, excellent. So the, um, uh, just on point three there, just uh, again on, on the issue of, of whether we can, uh, we're able to get contract research organizations contributing. Uh, compounds to the to the series. Um, I guess so. Frederick's been uh, uh, very um, in, interested in, in, in to contribute to the project, which is which is great, and has also expressed an interest in sharing data. Um, I have tried to approach um, several others uh, with a, a pitch that that I received help with uh, from people online, which was useful um, to suggest that companies could contribute one or two compounds for free uh, if they had downtime. Uh, between projects, and uh, all, so I think I've emailed maybe uh, maybe seven or eight, um, uh, but by no means exhausted that, uh, and have had not that much feedback from them on that idea. I I did receive an interesting comment on my blog post, which is linked there, from uh, the, the guy who is a, a founder, I think, of um, Assay Depot, so an organization which links. Uh, people who need work done to people who might be able to provide that. So I mean, similar to some of the ideas we've been talking about. Uh, and he's been helping a, a project in the States, um, which is a, a competition to, to try and get some work done in, on, on, a, on a rare disease. Uh, and they've uh, approached, I think uh, he says on, on the blog post there, he says that they've approached their, their network of suppliers and, and found a hit rate in the, in the, in the sort of 1% to 3% range of, of responses, which implies you have to uh, ask uh, you know 50 suppliers to to get one who might be willing to contribute, which is an interesting stat. Uh, I'm not there yet in terms of the number of companies I've approached, um, but I, I I'm going to persevere with this just because I'm interested. Um, however, uh, based on a conversation we had previously, uh, Paul, or I think I think we had maybe a, that involved uh, Tim, um, we we could try and be more targeted with it if uh, internally at MMV you had. Uh, Companies that might might be of uh, that might be interested, so we, we could be a little more targeted about it versus the approach that I'm taking, which is a little bit more shotgun. Um, uh, and we don't need to discuss that now, uh, but um, maybe if if it came up in conversation between you and Tim Wells, uh, maybe we could approach someone more specific. I don't know if that's a, a possible. No, I, I think that's definitely worth doing. I, I think it might be worth just thinking now, sort of strategically, uh, when we do that, that. In some ways, it might be worth doing that. For example, were we to decide to park the series and move to a new series, it may be better to sort of make that approach on the new series rather than a series that that, that we ended up then parking sort of a month later. Yeah, 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 yeah,
uh, uh, and Science Exchange, you're correct, uh, with, with offers of, of, uh, of quotes for, for business and so on. Um, I've, been, I've been also approaching a lot of TROs uh, 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 through a different channel, which is direct emails through the front door. Uh, and I guess um, uh, that, will that will have a, a, low, uh, a low hit rate. But it's still worth doing, I think, um, because I think that eventually we will find someone who, who is keen to contribute to the project in the way that I think Frederick is um, uh, as well. So uh, I think it just needs a little bit more effort. It is an unusual idea and an unusual request. So I think it just takes a bit more time. But yes, a, a concerted push on a, on a new series might be a better idea. Uh, so uh, it's a very interesting conversation, though. So if anyone has any uh, any any thoughts about about ways of including the the private sector in, in making what one or two compounds uh, on, on a project like this, then always always keen to hear ways in which we might be able to do that. Just uh, moving on on the agenda, because time's ticking by. Um, the current status of the other series. So we uh, obviously we've just got some preliminary data for the other two series, and these are the two series that Jimmy's been working on. Um, so Jimmy's now writing up his uh, thesis and uh, will not have much more time for exploration of some of these compounds. The synthesis of the, the hit compound, the thionopyrimidine, has proven to be intractable in the final Suzuki coupling, despite Jimmy's uh, considerable efforts. Uh, this compound has proven to be quite uh, annoying, and, uh, and the final coupling hasn't gone well uh, so far. Uh, so, um, if Jimmy were carrying on, he would uh, he would undoubtedly nail this. But he's got a he's got a hand in his thesis in a couple of weeks, and so has to write this thing. So, uh, one possibility is that um, yeah, if we decide if we finish, of course, the Aral Pearl series, then uh, someone who's currently on the project can uh, try and get that final step to work. It would be nice to confirm that hit, uh, just to make sure that it's it's real. Um, and I don't really, I don't really think that that will be too much of, a, of an issue. Jimmy's done a lot of work on getting the precursors ready, um, and so we have good route to all of these things. We've just got to try and nail that final Suzuki coupling. Uh, this is actually a reaction. It turns out that, uh, that Murray has some experience in, <laughs> in a negative way, I think, in the past. Uh, so this may be, <laughs> maybe one for him to revisit, given his experience today, but we haven't talked about it. But I think it would be nice to get that, uh, that sorted, um, depending on Jimmy's plans, are obviously, after his, uh, on, his, on his project is done. Um, so both of them are, are now writing to provide comments on, I think, you know, what they're planning on doing with this. But it would be nice to get that done. Uh, some of the precursors have been evaluated. Um, we're obviously also getting some of, uh, 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 so previously we, we have, have ordered um, some similar compounds from, from Malport, and those are some of the ones that are coming in. Uh, and those will be evaluated. Of course, if some of those appear to be active, that would make the series that, that would make uh, resynthesizing the original compound more attractive. Uh, so I guess that would also help to in, uh, inform us of uh, our decision about whether we we persevere with the time sign of which is quite useful actually to, to buy in compounds to to help uh, make us uh, help us make a decision. Um, yeah. So there's some comments from Jimmy and Murray. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy's done a sterling job on this, um, some difficult chemistry, and he's done a lot of controls, a lot of complicated NMR, uh, but it just didn't play ball in the end. So I think he's very close, but not quite there, uh, which is no fault of his. Um, okay, so uh, unless anyone's got any comments, I think that, that's, the, that's the line of attack. We, when we have a bit more time, um, uh, maybe if, if Jimmy, you know, hands in his honest thesis and he just can't sleep because he just wants to make this compound, he can come back. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Um, Okay. Um, indeed, it's a perfectly valid point, Sanjay. Um, okay, uh, one comment that I wanted to make about the website and the ELM. We we had a a, a very thorough um, discussion here about the the limitations, um, mostly the limitations, <laughs> some of the positives of the Synaptic Elite website and the Electronic Lab Notebook, uh, and the limitations in the design of those and how user friendly they are. There are a, a few things about that. Um, uh, I will uh, be asking a couple of people if they want to do some work over the summer on um, on implementing changes to the electronic lab notebook um, for which we have money on the grant to do that. So um, I'll be asking Mike, but I don't want to commit to him in a, uh, commit him in a, in a public forum to doing that work. But um, we would like to improve, obviously, some of the features of the electronic lab notebook. Things such as alerts to comments on posts. We, we've had situations in the past where people have commented on 
um, experiments and we don't realize because there's no alert functionality um, those things to make the um, the electronic lab notebook more Googleable, so people can find out what we're doing uh, using something which Mike has already designed, already designed, for example, to convert pictures into into text strings and smile strings, so that molecules can be searched. Uh, so things of that kind, which improve the functionality of the ELN, would be very useful. Uh, there's a bunch of other things which we've noted down this side, uh, which are just um, uh, irritations in using it. Uh, also, uh, in parallel to that, though, we need to improve the um, the landing page part, which is something that Paul Willis and I have talked about uh, before. Uh, which is a, a, a landing page for the Synaptic Lead website, which is where uh, people, if they if they search us or Google us, they will get to a, a certain a certain page which acts as a funnel to all of the new stuff that's happening, and that needs a complete redesign of, of how that site works. Now, um, I'm in touch with the uh, the founder of the Synaptic Lead, Ginger Taylor, about this. She is uh, she started it when she was taking a break from work, um, and is no longer you know able to commit a huge amount of time to the Synaptic Lead. Uh, she she's uh, the technical person behind everything. She maintains the servers and, and does other things, but it has no uh, has no time for uh, for input about site redesign. Uh, however, she does she has recently told me that she has a couple of contacts who expressed an interest. So they're, they're coders who expressed an uh, interest in in doing some uh, design on the site uh, in the coming months. Uh, so that's people who who uh, work near her, um, and that could be a way in which we can improve um, the site itself. We have to ask the question about whether the, the way the site is put together is good enough for what we want, in the sense that if there are limitations on this Drupal site, that the uh, uh, thing that this is built on, whether that's going to be enough um, to allow us the kind of functionality that we want. And most people were talking about the need for a page, which is attractive and interesting and constantly updated with what's going on, which is something we really lack at the moment. So that's it's very much on the agenda, and it depends a little bit on who we can recruit to do this. So if the if uh, if Ginger is not able to recruit a couple of people to sort this out, then that's going to require us to be a little bit more aggressive with trying to recruit people who can uh, redesign the site to some extent um, for us, and that's going to be a, an, an important part of, of things uh, for us in the next uh, couple of months. I mean, I I worry, of course, that you know we 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 get people who hear about the Snap Leap and Google it and go to a page. And then they find something which is old or, or, or doesn't link to uh, current events. Um, yeah, we need to make sure that um, that whatever is new, so the new experiments, new tweets, new posts, new things that are being said about the project uh, are, are on that front page, so people can find things very easily. Um, one, I mean, we've we've had a, a pretty good discussion here about the limitations of things. Um, one thing I think that you mentioned previously, Paul uh, Paul Willis. That you said you were going to do is is maybe also try and get people in uh, who um, could come to the site cold and also criticize uh, uh, the the site in terms of how difficult it is to get around. Um, we can do that before we try and revamp, or we can try and wait until we've done a bit of revamping. But any advice of that kind is is very useful, um, even though it's a constant stream of negatives. Those things are very useful for us to because uh, we have we have to make this thing uh, easy to, to search and easy to find the new the new information. So it's it's an important thing for us, and we do have money on the grant, so we need to spend that money to make sure that some of this stuff gets done. That sounds good. I think the other thing, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's going to be a critical thing in, in open source that we find a way of sort of on that landing page, kind of very simply and visually sort of summarizing the status of the project, where we are, what the key goals are, so someone could land on that and very quickly get up a bit up to speed. And I'm not sure anyone's come up with, with a good way of doing that. It's kind of complex, but, but I think if, if people have got ideas there that you know people can really quickly get up to speed and, and be able to contribute, I think that could be could be really helpful as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it it, um, it, it requires a, a conversation with a totally different set of people. Um, that's the that's the thing. I mean, quite rightly, you know, at the moment this is a, a science heavy project because we have to show that we can do the science and get the molecules made and get some data. But at some point, unfortunately, yeah, we have to think a lot harder about publicity and marketing. And the kind of landing page you're talking about, I mean, uh, yes, I, we, we, that's exactly what people were talking about here, um, something which is extremely visual. Um, so Mike's just talking about some progress bars for sub goals. Exactly. Don't put your hand up too high, Mike, otherwise we're going to ask you to do that. But that kind of thing, absolutely. So if we, if we can't do something really obviously visual like that and attractive using our current um, 
uh, system on Drupal, we may have to think about constructing a separate landing page, which is not something I really want to do, but it's not impossible that we would have a separate page which it acts as like a news feed of everything, but which is essentially completely visual. Yeah, I, I agree with you absolutely, and, and that's why we need people outside the project to be pretty brutal with with uh, with the, the current limitations of where we of where we broadcast things. Um, all right, so I mean, I think that's going to require me to have a conversation with some some web people and to follow up with Ginger about contacts that she has. She works in the software development field, so she knows a lot of the people who can do that. Uh, and Mike is is our resident whiz on some of the stuff. Um, uh, again, yeah, I think maybe there will be some people who are interested in doing this um, for a good cause. Um, there are certainly be seem to be a lot of like-minded people at the Open Knowledge Festival in Helsinki a couple of uh, last month. People who would be interested in helping out with doing something like this. But if not, we really, I mean, we budgeted for things like this, and, and now's the time to spend the money, I think. Yeah, um, yeah Paul, uh, postdoc Paul has just reminded me uh, that we also on the to-do list is to get back in touch with the original team uh, behind the Electronic Lab Notebook um, to ensure that we can get the data migrated from Southampton over to Australia. Uh, we want to make sure that all the data on the project is based in the cloud, in the um, in the Nectar system in Australia. We want to make sure it's backed up there. Um, and that's just, uh, it's been on the to-do list and, and uh, I and, and Jeremy Frey have just been a little bit too busy to, to have a proper conversation about it um, whenever on Skype at the same time, it looks like. So we need to get all the data over here to make sure that it's here and also backed up. That's partly because we want to make sure it's backed up here, but partly because we want to demonstrate um, that this is a way of conducting academic research in Australia electronically in a way that is um, acceptable to all the funding agencies and all the universities. So it's it's a part of a, of, a, of a big move to try and get things away from paper. Uh, but thanks for that note. Yes, that's also something that's important to do. Okay, um, so that it's it's coming at 5.30. If, is there anything else that anyone would like to raise for discussion by everyone uh, now? Someone's phoning in. Just uh, inform everyone, Matt, I'll take it as an action to, to start looking out uh, a few other series that potentially if, if we do decide to park uh, the first series then, then by next month we've got another series or two to consider that we could then uh, start to move up into the programme. Yeah, I, I think that would be great. So if, um, I don't know if that, yeah, for, from whatever source, I guess it, 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 the, the way we did this previously of course was to make sure that any series that were um, described in the original GSK work, for example, were not being worked on by GSK. So I guess the besides the quality of the series, we just want to be sure that no one else is working on those. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if that's if that's an action item you want to take, that's sensational. <laughs> if, if other people, I don't want to make it an exclusive club. So if other people, you know, feel free to bring other series to the table for the discussion. I mean, that would be a great position to be in if we had sort of three or four series, and then we we could decide which, as a group, we preferred most and wanted to work with. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, yeah. Paul is just making some comments about uh, analysis we did on on filter data sets a while ago, which uh, we could bring back up. Um, uh, Frederick's asking if there's anything known about the mode of action of these compounds. Um, so not not yet. Um, no, there was some predictive work that was done that suggested that. Uh, some of the earlier series that were made in this, some of the early compounds that were made in, in um, this series and the near neighbor series, had activity against DHODH, one of the um, one of the one of the interesting targets for malaria. Um, we uh, we had asked uh, GSK to do a screen against that target, um, and I'm not sure that, that uh, ever happened. But it's something that they were certainly very happy to do, and which maybe I should be following up on. Um, you see, but that was a prediction. No, so in general terms, now this is from a phenotypic assay, so we don't know what the targets are. It's a uh, general feature of this, uh, this project. Fine, to, 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 to Jimmy's comment that I'd seen uh, going through on the chat about the phenoprimidines being pursued by GSK. I mean, uh, there are related series being pursued, but I think this hit is distinct enough that at present it, 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 it's fine. And that's not necessarily by GSK, so I'm talking just about the wider community because uh, we maintain an awareness of, of, of all that's going on. So, uh, 
that's just you know we know what's going on in the community and at the moment the, the series that, that you're working on is is fine one of the most valuable things about having you guys involved involved in this whole thing is the, is the fact that you know what's going on in the community okay okay um all right any any other business before we uh we conclude if if not then um that's been very useful thank you very much for uh for turning up so yeah we by this time next uh month uh the next time we have this meeting i'll, I'll advertise again so we can get together um i'll spread the word uh we will hopefully have enough data to to finally uh uh enhance or bring the curtain down on our, our aral payroll series um that should be that should be completely doable. So that will be the main item of business for the next meeting. Um, okay, but if there's uh, if that's everything, then um, everyone on this side of the world have a good weekend. Thank you for coming. Uh, Paul in Geneva, have a very nice day. Hope it's not too cold. And uh, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll see everybody uh, next time. Thank you for coming along, guys. <laughs>